Hi, everyone. This is Emily at Naps, and I'm here today on the podcast with a very special guest and now friend, I, I'd say, right, Julia? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm Julia Ludwig. She is a wellness coach. Um, you work with a lot of couples, which I want to talk about. You're also a mom. You're a certified fair play facilitator, which we're going to talk mm -hmm. a lot about fair play, the book today. And you're now my new friend because you live in Charlestown and we just realized our kids go to the same school and we see each other at school pickup, which is really fun. Totally. Thanks Hi, thank you so today. much for having me. Thanks <laughs> for having me. I think my favorite email that I received from you was that we did go to the same school and you were lightly stalking me at school pickup. And I was like, oh my God, you have to stop me and say hi to me. I go to school pickup like an idiot. Half I'm late. I'm running in. I got to grab the kids, the dog sometimes with me. And then we're going to like swim or gymnastics. It's ridiculous. So. Oh, I totally know. But you're like one of those people around town that like everybody knows. You're kind of like a mini celebrity, no. maybe a real celebrity. <laughs> oh. um, so I would see you from afar. I'm like, oh, that's Emily Silver. <laughs> yeah. I should meet her. Oh um, so God. this was just my ploy to get to be friends with you. Too funny. So I am so excited to have you here today. I think obviously I want to talk about for people listening, the book Fair Play and what it means for you uh, to be a facilitator, among all the other things that you do. But the probably the best place to start is why this is so important and why we brought you on today. I definitely feel at NAPS, something that we constantly are talking about with our moms is this idea of being clear and direct with your partner and dividing up household chores. And um, we talk a lot about maternal gatekeeping which some of this stuff is covered in the book, but I want to go even further into fair play. I have it with me. I, everyone at Naps knows my guilty pleasure at night is to watch The Real Housewives, but I am trying to read again. I cannot read when I'm pregnant or newly postpartum because I just fall asleep, but I'm mm -hmm. almost through the book. I love, did you ever do the app Blinkist? Blinkist, I think it is. And you can listen. No, to but I've heard of it. Okay, yeah. cool. So I listened to the blink on fair play a long time ago. And I was like, Oh my God, I need to read that book because it's like everything, but tell me a little bit about fair play. Um, but also I want to talk to everyone listening about why it's so important, like to be talking about this stuff now. Yeah. Like how did well, you fall into this work? Yeah. Let's start there. So great question. Um, I became a coach during the pandemic. Um, I came from, um, a fitness instructor background, I was struggling during the pandemic without having, you know, a studio to go to. The online wasn't really working for me. So I was like, what can I do? Um, first of all, I wasn't taking care of myself. And I was feeling that I was feeling it, you know, spilling out on my family. I was, you know, less patient. I was not happy. Um, so many things, you know, we were just in that survival mode. And I really was in survival mode and not taking care of myself. So I was like, I've always been a seeker of tools. I'm a yoga instructor. Like I, you know, very much in that mindfulness space. And I came to coaching and realized I can gather tools and maybe share them with other moms. Um, and I really found like, if you can take time for yourself away from what we call in fair play, the three P's, parent, partner, or professional role, um, you can truly fill your cup. You know, it's really hard to do that when you're focused on other people. And that's what all those roles do. And so if you can take some time to yourself and fill your cup with something that really lights you up, you can come back stronger in all three roles. And so I really wanted to be, I really came from this whole thing, wanting to be a better mom to my four-year-old because um, she was at the time three-year-old and a total monster. And I was yeah. just not handling Everyone it. Everyone well. says terrible twos, but for me, yeah. it was three. I, three. I thought two was three. fine. And three, I was mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, where can I return you? Like what's happening here? Same, 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 same. So um, I came to coaching and I, and I knew I wanted to do this for other moms too. I'm like, this is great information that, you know, other people can use. And as I was branching out and starting to get clients, I realized everyone I spoke to, was like, this is a wonderful idea, but I just, there's no way I can make time for this, you know, to spend time, to invest in yourself, time and money on finding something that's going to take you away from your family. It's a really hard thing for moms to wrap their head around. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I need to step back. And at that time, 
um, my God bless him. My husband sent me the Jessica Yellen podcast with Eve Brodsky talking about um, find your unicorn space, which is her newer book. Um, and it, it delves into that a little bit in fair play. And I was, you know, really into that because it gave me language and some structure around what I wanted to do for moms. And while kind of investigating that, I came across like a facilitatorship training for fair play where it was like, okay, if you want your unicorn space, your time for yourself, where you're just working on something that makes you excited and interested, um, we need to make some time. Like we can't just pull it out of the air. I cannot just build another hour or two into your day. Um, we have to actually take it from somewhere. And so we came to the fair play facilitator training where I learned, you know, how much we are doing, how much of that burnout is coming from the mental load of motherhood and how, if we can shift part of that cognitive labor to our partners, it's not just, I'm doing too much. You're not doing enough. Let's transfer that work. Right. It's about spreading that, that load across our family that actually brings our family closer together. So I loved everything about it, where it was like, the whole goal of Fair Play is to bring the family back together to be more efficient and actually more deeply connected. So it's work and it's hard. It's a hard conversation to start and we'll get a little bit more into like what Fair Play is, I think later in our talk, but it just, it served all of my needs for helping moms. You know, it just gets back to helping moms. Yeah. I mean, I think too, when we think about when people reference Fair Play or in general talk about being fair around the house, immediately many women that I work with go to just the basic chores of the household and sort of like splitting those up, which is something that we actually talk about in our um, mom survival guide groups is mm -hmm. to split that shit up, right? And keep it kind of fair, but there's so much more outside of the basic household tasks. And what's fun about fair play is they have this deck of cards, right? It's like a game. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny, right? Yep. So if you want to do it with your family or your partner, it's almost, it's hard to have these conversations and change what you've been doing forever and ever. But I love the fact that they designed a deck of cards. Is it a hundred cards? It is a hundred cards, which sounds like a lot. It's funny um, though, right? And it's not just like, take the trash out, do the laundry. It has all the mental to-do list things, the second shift stuff that's going on around your house, invisible yeah. work, which I know we'll talk about, but yeah. I think it's kind of cool that they put it on cards and we're like, get these cards and make it fun. Absolutely. And the whole <laughs> point is to like bring your partner. It's not, you know, the, the book starts and you know, well, um, with Eve, like with her shit, I do list, which is a very long list. And I think we'll probably get to your shit. I do list. I made um, one for you, Julia. I made a shit. I would I do love list for you today. I'd love night. to hear it. <laughs> I would love to hear it. Do you want to talk about it now or I mean, save it? So but when I got into making this list, just for people who are listening, I was reading the book. I've been reading the book and they talk about the different kinds of work. So maybe we should start there. Right. And I can tell, right. I'll say what they are and maybe you can speak to them. Right. We have the mental load, which I think all moms can relate with. That's just the mental stuff that's in my head. It's like, I remember just being postpartum and my husband, husband came home and he would say, what did you do all day? And you stand there like a deer in headlights and you're like, I, I don't know what I did all day, but you're like, I did so much stuff in my brain. I just, I can't think of what they were. It's like the mm -hmm. mental list that never ends. Mm -hmm. That one. Uh, and then I know it talked about second shift. God, I love that it's called second shift. Like I come it's to work. A job. Day. Yeah. I come to my job at naps every day. I work mm -hmm. Monday through Friday I try to get to my office between 8.30 and 9. And then I leave between 3 and 4 to go to my second shift. Yeah. What's the second well, shift? <laughs> and I would even argue, Emily, that you have a third shift. Because your second shift is caregiving. That's with your kids. Okay. Yeah, tell then me my shift. Third shift. Then there's the third shift where you're actually getting stuff done. Like, right? Are you, you know, are you making lunches after they go to bed? Are you mm -hmm. doing laundry? Are you putting stuff away? Are you putting the house back together? Are you ordering freaking Halloween costumes and Christmas gifts. You know, you can't do that while you're carting your kids to their next activity or helping them with their homework. So right. you have three jobs and I would, you know, I appreciate and I that. Include, I'm adding I something include, to my list here too. Keep going. There you go. Um, I want to include stay at home moms. Could be when you're a stay at home mom, especially with those little, little guys, 
you're not doing all of the other tasks that you need to be doing. Like, how are you folding laundry? Are you, you know, there's the, you know, I know that's probably a joke um, at Nurture by Naps, but the sleep when the baby sleeps kind of thing. Like, no, that's when you're getting your stuff done. That's when you have to do shit. And you're not, (laughs) yes, exactly. So like, I want to really include the stay-at-home moms. You have two jobs. Like you're running the house, you're keeping the train on track and on time. And you're also caring for this baby or small children, which like, right. you know, the 18 month old that like is just walking and into everything, you're not getting a lot done when you're watching them, Yeah, you know? So if you come home and like, there, if your partner comes home and there's dishes in the sink and they're like, what did you do all day? It's like, you have no idea. I know. I mean, that this comes up in my groups. I mean, I just wrapped up a group and I had another one prior to that, but I, I did ha- have a mom sort of look at me and she was a stay at home mom and she felt badly having her partner take on more of the things because she is home all day. And we Mm. had this, I had this moment where I was like, I'm going to tell you what my therapist told me. Everybody's working and everybody's tired when you have a newborn at home, we're all Mm -hmm. working and we're all tired, but it is, Mm -hmm. it is very hard to get out of that mindset that what you're doing is and is perhaps valuable or the time isn't as important as the person, the partner, whoever it is that's leaving and working and making the money all day. Right. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about the four rules, but you're just talking about that first rule kind of under the level. I I know I'm see here I go, Julie. I just get so it's hard. It's hard. Just let me wrap, let me wrap up the kind of work. Let's do that. Oh yeah. yeah. Load the second shift. Oh, I love that it talked about the different type of work. They added emotional labor. Like nobody ever talks about that. That's like just maintaining relationships in your life. It's like your kid, it's your kid at school, right? Like your girls are getting older. I am amazed at how early like the little kiddo drama is starting now. Like, you know, you're not waiting till they're 14 or 15. Like drama starts in elementary school. You have to worry about your kids, you know, being bullied or bullying. You have to worry about your kids not being invited to a party or not making the team or the play. Like that is like a lot on your heart and your brain. Right. And how to deal with it. Like Mm-hmm. How to, you know, how much to get involved outside of the house? How much do you work with your child to be resilient and, you know, confident in who they are and true to who they are? Like, that's right. a lot of work. Right. It really is. And then what about, like, I think about, it makes me thinking about my relationship with just my husband. Absolutely. I mean, I ebb and flow and like what I'm really, I feel really killing it at work one week and I'm crushing it as mm. a mom and like this wave and I had an epiphany with my husband this summer where we're like, God, I, we don't really, we need to do more together. Right. So then I'm like, I got to make sure that we're, we, we need to make sure that we're going on date nights or like yeah. maybe we go do something during the day on a weekend without our kids. And so there's yeah. so many things, right? Yeah. And another so one was things. invisible work, which is just my favorite, the invisible work. I call it me and my family. So my sisters and my cousins and her mom, we call it the magical fairy that comes. The magical fairy that comes and does all the things. Like the toothpaste that she says in the book, the toothpaste is always there. You're welcome. (laughs) Yep. Yep. And nobody thinks about it. The clothes in the drawer. What's the difference between the mental load and the invisible work? Like mental and... So I think invisible work is the, the getting stuff done. And it just being there, you know, having, you know, napkins to get, you know, having paper towels and toilet paper stocked, having, you know, just thinking ahead because you know what a pain it is to run out of something. Mm -hmm. So you're always thinking a couple of steps ahead. I think the mental load is um, the, for me, the mental load is thinking about like the holidays. Okay. How do we get to each Um, family, you know, what are the logistics of that? Making sure like when, you know, the dentist or the doctor's appointments are happening, um, you know, little stuff like haircuts and stuff like that. Like, you know, like the stuff again, that you need to, to have like this, you know, they have all these apps, which drives me crazy. The fact that we need all of these apps and like, can't. like their home management systems, you know, now we're, now we're project managers as well as totally. CEOs and like conductors of this like little universe that we have. Um, 
And like, I I honestly, I I feel like it's homework. I don't want to like go and like plan everything out, like and type it like, that's just not my personality. Some people thrive in that and like more power to you. Um, But yeah, I love that they take, you know, we, we say like cognitive labor or mental load and they break it down to like all the different aspects of that. And it really hits home how much work you are doing. So when you're talking about my partner works out of the house and makes money. When you're talking about all this work you do, just because you don't earn a paycheck right. doesn't make it invaluable, right? That work has value and it keeps your house running. The fact that you do all that work allows your partner to leave the home mm-hmm. and go make that paycheck. So it goes both ways. So it's very much, it really, really crushes me and drives me crazy when people are like, you know, you hear on these like social media and TikTok things that like, um, you, she should be grateful because you don't have this life without me. Right. You don't have this life without me earning the bread, being yeah. the breadwinner. And um, it goes both ways. It totally yeah. goes both ways. Totally. I mean, Grace and Maddie are five and seven now and Eloise is going to be one. So there's a, a, there's a gap between them. But when Grace and Maddie were little, they were newborns and babies. I was home a lot. Um, and I, I figured out how to work and run naps on the side while I was with them. And my husband worked at a different job, um, a lot of hours, but that was something that we spoke about recently because now that Eloise is here and she's one and we've had time we we're pretty we're pretty fair and square and we've we've played this game a little bit and we're we're always mm-hmm. working on it but um sure. the conversation did recently come up how i am now working on sort of growing my career uh because things are a bit more fair and we have great childcare and things like that but we look back at those years when grace and maddie were really little and where my husband is at in his career and he we sort of he said and we talked about like how he was able to do that because I was at home doing all the other things. And it felt really awesome to talk about it from that lens and yeah. feel a little bit like valued at that time in my life too. So, right. I, yeah. and I, I love that you were able to get that. I wish you were able to see that while you were in it, because totally. I'm sure those were hard years for you. And, yeah. and you feel, you know, there's, there's this feeling um, when you're not, not valued, when it's not seen all this, you know, all this, internal stuff that we do all this cognitive labor that transitions into actual the physical life you are creating and building daily for your family when that's not acknowledged that's when disconnection and resentment happens with your partner and that that's really like the heart of fair play it's to prevent or correct for that resentment and that disconnection we're trying to take that away from your family so that you guys can be stronger and last longer because frankly, marriages fail because of this, yeah. because of this invisibility, because of not feeling appreciated or seen or supported. Right. You know, the fact that you were able to hear that your efforts, your incredible superhuman efforts, by the way, <laughs> because it's ridiculous what we ask of mothers, facilitated your husband's success. Oh, and by the way, just husbands, just um, men. And, and I speak a lot and I, I say this a lot, but we speak in, um, in cisgendered and, and heterosexual relationships mostly because I'm talking a lot about gender roles in our society. And so that's right. why I'm often talking about man and woman. This system of division of labor is for, for any partner. It could be for roommates. It could be for two sisters. Like me and my sister lived together in Beacon Hill many years ago. We could have used the system. Um, so the system is for everyone, but kind of the the lead up is, is very much gendered. So I, um, I don't think I need to apologize for that, but I want to explain why I'm talking so much in mother, father, um, terms, but fathers get a, there's a fatherhood bonus when a father has a child. And by the way, when a father really commits to fair play, they see an improvement in their career based on just the statistics of like results of this playing out after the couple of years that we've been watching kind of couples go through the system. And, you know, what it does out in the world is fathers kind of win at every level. Right. And we're just trying to level up moms so that they're not being punished for creating these families. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I made a list for you. Do you want me to read it to you? 
I would love okay. to hear your list. So I just love the invisible work stuff. I think it's hilarious. Now I will say when I, the reason I made this list, cause I was reading the book and they were talking about the toothpaste mm-hmm. and I was thinking, okay, my husband does the toilet, pa- the toilet paper, the toothpaste, the diapers, the wipes. And I was starting to be like, what do I do? And I was like, I'm just going to write down the shit that's in my head in the last 24 hours, which is that Eloise needs a pediatrician appointment next week because she's turning one. So Mm -hmm. that means she needs vaccines and Grace and Maddie are going to need their flu shots. Mm -hmm. Um, Maddie needs a haircut. It's it's all over the place. I have to finish turning over the summer clothes to the fall clothes because they can't all be in the drawers at the same time, but it's getting cold out which means I need to look at the school uniforms and I actually need to order a few more, which I order them on Amazon, but then I drop them off to somebody to embroider and then I have to pick them up again. Um, Eloise is walking and doesn't have shoes. So I need to get her shoes that fit. There's soccer on the weekends. So I have to like make sure that their soccer bag is packed. Um, Gymnastics is ending, but the re-registration form is out this week. I need to fill that out and send it in. Swim team started, but Grace's goggles are broken. So I need to get a new pair of goggles. Her tooth, Grace's tooth is about to fall out. So I need to make sure I have money, cash this weekend, because I think it's going to fall out this weekend, which also means I need to take cash out for the nanny because it's Friday. I pay her on Fridays. There's a reading log. There's a reading log that both of my kids have to fill out and bring back on Monday. And if they don't fill it out and I don't make sure it gets in the backpack, like it's not going to get back. And you reminded me, I have to order the Halloween costumes. So that's my current mental, my that's mental. It's invisible work that I'm doing outside of working. And honestly, week. that's just what you thought of. Like, totally. I, I bet if we, you know, like that's just what was on the top of your head in the moment you did that. Like, uh, that's not comprehensive, you know, it's wild. And, um, I was speaking with someone yesterday and she, she did this exercise with someone else. It's actually someone, you know, and she did this exercise with her partner, um, I don't think she'd mind my sharing. Um, but he kind of came back and he was like, well, I do. Um, I, you know, I'm thinking about like what we have to do in the yard for the, you know, to like winterize the yard. And, um, I think about what, you know, we're doing with our family planning. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's the stuff you do is time sensitive. So that's the difference. The stuff that typically our partners are getting involved in is very much can be done whenever, like, you know, some stuff like maybe cleaning the gutters or like, it's a one-time thing. You do it once a year or, you know, you're fertilizing the lawn or even mowing the lawn, like happens once in a while, making the lunches, ordering the school uniforms, like the, the whole, the whole mental load that just goes along with starting the school year is wild, wild. right? <laughs> and then you're having to do it every day. You're emptying the backpacks. You're filling them back up with a healthy lunch. You have to think about healthy, non-allergen, maybe they're gluten-free lunches every single day. Like same for babies non-stop. and the diaper bag. Like absolutely. Bottles, you're constantly you're filling. Hard. You can't the cleaning the bottles. Oh my gosh, yeah. the cleaning the bottles. Make sure um, you have all your tubing and your flanges and your bits when you leave in the morning and that there's enough milk in the freezer for the baby or formula restocked. Like it's it's all the ages. It's insane. <laughs> so when we talk about the the hundred, the hundred cards and the hundred which are tasks, there are a hundred different tasks. Um, and you don't need to, you don't need to look at all hundred. I can speak to that more, but like there are tasks that are called daily grinds. There are 30 daily grinds in the, in the um, deck of cards and they go across all different suits. So they're out, they're home, they're caregiving, and they're the magic suits. Um, and they're 30 daily grinds that have to get done. You can't do them necessarily on your own table timetable and they're repetitive. They're over and over and over. It's the laundry, it's the dishes, it's the, you know, getting ready for school. It's the bath time, bedtime. Moms, when you look at that and do the kind of, all right, like, let's, you know, just assess who's doing what in the house. Typically moms are doing those daily grinds. That is what is causing burnout. That is what is causing Mm -hmm. overwhelm. That is what is causing resentment because we are doing the daily grinds where the dad's just like, oh, I'm going to mow the lawn and then I'll go golfing. I don't mean to like, I don't mean to denigrate dads. Like they're doing so much. And this whole point isn't to be like, moms do too much. Dads don't do enough we need dads to do more. You're not doing enough. You're not doing your job. That is not it. 
dads are doing great. And especially I think in our community, most moms are like, oh, my husband does so much. He does the execution part we talked about. Oh yeah. You know? So we have to, can you explain to everyone, guys, this will blow your mind. Um, yeah. CPE, CPE, right? Conception, planning, execution. Execution. Right. So go ahead. I, I'm just thinking about the dads out there and the partners listening, right? Like we are doing the daily grind as women because we haven't asked them to do it. That's really bad. Absolutely. Because right? I think about my, my husband now, like we are going every other day of the daily grind every other day. Um, but that's new for us, right? Eloise is our third, but mm-hmm. we take turns getting mm-hmm. up with the baby in the morning and whoever mm-hmm. goes down with the baby, brews the coffee, makes the lunches, unloads the dishwasher and gets the backpacks ready. And then that's we beautiful. just, we just go every other day, but that's because they asked him to do it. Prior to that, I was doing it every morning and I was fucking resentful, right? Because I was yeah. like this guy just get comes down in the morning, lets the dog out and gets his coffee. And I'm brushing hair and putting out school uniforms and making lunches. Right. So I want to say, I want to give some credit out there to the partners listening, because it's, it's really like, it's usually on us. Like we're usually the problem. So I love, love, love that you said that I'll get to CP in one second, but I just started um, my October workshop. I'm doing a four week workshop um, with a small group of women. And the first lesson, the first day is devoted to the things we have internalized and how we are not responsible for this system. We, um, it's been modeled for us. Our society has kind of created this for us. It's in the air we breathe and the water we drink, um, but we are complicit in it. And we do have to do some unlearning and we have to do some kind of retraining. How do we communicate with our partners? Next week, we're gonna talk about communication and that invitation, that how do we ask our partners to participate in this without making them feel attacked or like they're not doing enough? Mm -hmm. They haven't, you know, they haven't been given the tools. A big thing we say in fair play is this is about empowering dad to feel like he can get up like that. He can make the lunch. I've talked to so many people in these last couple of weeks being like my husband literally like just sent me a text. Like, what do I put in the lunch? It's like you put in food that your child would eat. Like, you know, we all have our basket of approved school snacks. I don't know. Like what just do pull some things out of there. Every day, start I mean, there. It's, <laughs> exactly. It's like, you know what? The other day I made lunch and most of it came home and Poppy was like, yeah, I don't like that sun butter shit. And um, I'm not eating oranges all of a sudden and don't give me carrots. Like apparently she won't eat orange food or something. Like her entire lunch came back. She was starving. I made it. Like- it's hit or miss for all of us. So stop freaking out. Just put some damn food in the lunchbox. And By the way, school. I don't write back to those texts. Like if I get a text, because I've gotten those, I don't anymore, mm-hmm. but I did. Uh, what do I put in the lunch? I just, I let that sit purposely until school has started. And then it's like, oh, sorry, just got this. And it's like, they figured it out. <laughs> yeah, figure it out. That's like my best, my best, you know, like this is my unlearning is instead of going into fix it mode, Right. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to figure that lunches. out? Let's use lunches for CPE. Is that a good Great. one? Cool. Yes. Tell perfect. Tell the people what's so CPE. Breaking it down. CPE is conception. Lunches need to be made. Our children need to eat lunch. Planning. So having, you know, done the shopping and like knowing that you have food available each morning for lunch, not having to scramble because you didn't go shopping on the weekend or whatever. So, you know, deciding what what is acceptable for lunches, you know, um, I know there's been some talk about bento boxes, but I do love my bento box that has like protein, dairy, like snack, fruit, vegetable. I'm like, I live by that thing. I'm like, yep, that's where, that's where the cucumbers go because whatever the box tells me. I don't have to think about it. (laughs) I don't have to think about it. I trust that it's balanced. Um, it's, that's easy for me. Yeah. Um, but I know everyone has their different things. So just making sure that you have all of those available things so that you can throw in like the bar, the pouch, like the juice box, whatever you need to put in the lunch, making sure it's available yeah. and in, in an organized way. Like, you know, this is a lot about living intention. So, and then the execution is the night before the morning of you actually put it in the lunch box, it gets in the bag. So completing the task and we can get to that too, like kind of the minimum standard of care, like what is done. So conception, what's the task that needs to be done? Planning, making sure you know how it's going to happen and then execution, actually getting it done. 
So typically in many households, mom is focused on the conception and the planning. Mm -hmm. She's gotten all like whatever, 10 steps to go. And then dad does the execution and, you know, parades are, are, you know, planned for them and awards are given out because they, you know, pack the lunch. That's where the resentment comes from though. When they, yeah. they when someone gets the credit for the task that they did and yeah. then you're kind of sitting there and you're like, but I did everything leading up to the task. And I think yeah. that that's really, so would your action, would your advice be that when dividing up the tasks or the chores or whatever it is that you're doing, that you try to make it so that whoever's doing it does the full thing CPE. Yes, absolutely. Obviously. Right. You're handing over the full task, but you're also, you're not just handing them and being like, good luck with it, dude. You're having that first meeting or couple meetings. And this is why I think, you know, we, we read the book and we have the cards and we're like, all right, let's do it. And you like hand it to your partner and they're like, what? And yeah. it's like, I, I did this to my husband and I actually did it before I did the unlearning work. And that's where we fell down. So I'm like, let's do this. Let's do this. Like, let's, let's split up the task. And we failed because I didn't let go. Right. right. Um, uh. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, the idea is that you have meeting, you divide up the tasks and, and the ones that are important to you, there are a hundred cards. You could start with five, 10 cards, right? You could just focus on how can we make mornings easier? I love you in your planning. What you're doing without, you know, maybe so many words is you're redealing every other day or every day. So you redeal the morning cards to your husband tomorrow and you get to go sit down and have the cup of coffee and take out the dog. You know, like you get to take some time, but he knows that you did it yesterday. So he's not resentful. And tomorrow, you know, the next day when you're doing the whole thing, you know that he did it the previous day. Totally. So you're not resentful. And that is, that's the magic of this is that it brings out the resentment because you know that you're each doing your fair share. And it's not equal. You know, a lot of our partners like leave the house, go to work. It's about equity. It's about feeling, first of all, feeling seen, highlighting all that invisible work to yourself and to your partner, feeling like it has value. And then it's about um, feeling like you're each pulling your weight, you know, and it's going to look different for every family. Right. It's funny, like using that example, I'll just tell everyone listening how we got to that place of every other day. There was a time um, when it was just Grace and Maddie that I was doing most of the conception and planning of the morning. So I would, it would start at bedtime too, like making sure that the bento boxes are clean and that the school uniforms are laid out, but I would get up in the morning and I would not just make the lunches and the waters and the backpacks and the breakfast, but brush the hair, put the uniforms on, like literally tee them up. And then my husband would walk them to school and drop them off at school, which was great. But I did start to get a little, like, I was getting a little resentful because I'm like, I did all that work. And then he just gets to walk them down. I was thinking about the other night I gave Eloise a tub, got her in her pajamas and she was fussy. Like I had to get her in the tub. I, I fed her dinner, got her all cozy in her pajamas. And I made this nice big warm bottle. And I was going to go into the, I was about to go up the stairs and have the best moment, right? Of the finale, which is where you sit in the dark and the rocking chair and do the bottle. And my husband looked at me and was like, I can put her to bed right now if you want. And I go, absolutely not. And I was like, I'm sealing this deal. I just did all the work. I just did all the hard work. I'm going to go up and, and I said this, I'm like, I'm going to go up and enjoy this. And he was laughing. He's like, I know you want to rock her. That's the best part. I'm like, yeah, I am going to take the best part. Feed her her bottle and finish putting her to bed. <laughs> Good for you. Because that also told him that also, you know, told him in no uncertain terms that like, you did all the work, you know, like, it's and it, it's not about that. It's not <laughs> about, you know, yeah. Yeah. If you want to put her to bed, you can, you can do that, that, that runway of getting her all cozy and snuggly. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that's really valuable that you, you know, just highlighted that like, this isn't just, you don't just get the good parts, you know? Right. Right. Well, for people who are listening, there's so like we could talk about this all day. There's rules of really? play, and I'm just gonna say what they are, and then, uh, but um, I want to like give a little bit of context of how people can find you and like learn more about this too. Great. But the rules, which we we can't get through them all today because there's just so much to talk about. But just starting with like all time being created equal, 
reclaiming your right to be interesting again, like finding that time for you, getting started with where you are now, and then figuring out your values and standards. And so the bro- the book really spends time breaking down once you do your cards, like these actual rules. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what would be super helpful, Julia, for people listening is just, there's a lot happening here, especially in this podcast. Where's like the best place to get started with this? Is it, especially if someone's listening, like I can't even, I can't read a book right now, but like, where's the best place to get started and how do people find you? Because what's super cool about your coaching is that you work with couples all the time too. Absolutely. Um, I think it really helps and you can go on fairplay.com, um, fairplaylife.com and you can find a facilitator, um, one of, you know, a couple people in Boston that do this. And it's really just getting started. Only kind of started the trainings last year around this, um, documentary, which would really be a great place to start if you have no idea about fair play. So there's a documentary um, by Hello Sunshine and um, Jennifer Seibel Newsom. She's actually um, a producer of documentaries. And if you follow her, she's incredible on like um, just fair wage and and paid leave. Um, She's the wife of Governor Newsom in California and in her own right, she's just a rock star. And so she and Eve put together this documentary explaining fair play following a couple of families very different families so it's really good to see how this plays out in different households um and it's it's again it's not meant to be divisive it shows how you know once there's understanding and a light shed on the invisible work and all the all the labor that goes into running a house that partners come in and they you know they respect and appreciate their partners more but they also feel empowered to help, you know, it opens those lines of communication of asking for help and becoming vulnerable as the caregiver and as the breadwinner coming in and saying, you know what, I can do this. I can take this on. I, you know, I have the ability to do this and it's empowering them to do it. So a great place to start would be watching that um, documentary and it's available anywhere you get them. Like you can just watch it on Netflix. Um, I would love to do, my goal is to do showings. I'm not allowed to do showings at this point yet um, publicly, but and that, that would be my goal eventually is to do showings either, you know, virtually or live um, where I can host you and we can facilitate conversation around it. Um, personally, I do workshops and one-on-one as well as couples coaching. I'm doing a virtual workshop right now. Um, in November, I'm going to do an intro to Fair Play at Asana. Um, our little yoga studio in town. I'm going to use their space for just like an hour and a half intro for a small group. Um, There are lots of places you can do this. You can follow Fair Play Life on Instagram. And there are a lot of, um, I can share facilitators to follow. And I'm trying to put a lot of content out there, just giving those kind of introductory tools and kind of the why Um, this is valuable. I think just recognizing that your family is surviving and not thriving. Right. Um, recognizing that you're struggling should be enough for you to feel like there must be a different existence out there for my family. Um, and just starting that conversation. Well, to, this is a great place to end too, because we talked about this before we got started, you and you and I, but it's when to get started with this. So I know that people listening to this podcast, some of them are in it, right? They have kids, It's probably not feeling fair. Maybe there's resentment. There's a lot of mental load and invisible work and people are listening. Okay. Okay. I can make the change. Right. But for those who are not there yet, right. Maybe they're pregnant or they're going to be starting a family or they just brought a baby home. You know, I, I would assume that ideally it would be great to think about this stuff in advance. You bet. You bet. I think um, the the magic words of, you know, any big life transition, we'll figure it out, right? Like we'll figure it out. And when you're expecting a baby or you're, you know, planning on bringing a child into your home, however that looks for you, you're thinking about so many things and you, you plan as much as you can, but you don't know what it's going to look like on the other side of things. But when a child enters your home, typically um, in most states in our country because um, the uh, income allocated to childcare and childcare support is abysmal. Um, Mom is staying home, caregiver staying home for a period of time. It could be as short as four weeks, which is criminal. 
And partners are typically not staying home that much. Sometimes they have a week or two. Um, sometimes they have a really generous paternal leave program that they're just really not encouraged to take. They, you know, it's there to say that they have it, but socially or professionally, it just doesn't feel like the right move. Mm -hmm. um, and also sometimes partners just don't feel empowered, right? You come home, especially um, for, for, you know, your audience of, of moms giving birth, they come home, they're so overwhelmed with, you know, just that post partum hormone influx and all of the newness and all of the bonding. And, you know, you're so close to this little baby and you become the expert and you become the expert of how to feed them, when to feed them, how to change them, what to wear, you know, and it's hard to come in. So, you know, to have this conversation beforehand, to open that conversation up to both partners saying, okay, when this baby comes, like, let's work together right. to figure out what we're each doing. Um, I had this incredibly evolved uh, friend of mine when they were home for six weeks with their baby and realized it wasn't working. Like mom was really struggling. Dad, you know, didn't know how to help. So they developed a plan where when he came home from work, he took from 6 p.m. to midnight. Mm. Anything that baby needed, he was on it. She was doing a ton of other stuff around that. But like if the baby cried, it wasn't on her. She didn't have to go rush to the baby. Right. And it took that mental load of like caring for this child for just that little period of time off. And it afforded him this unique opportunity to really get to know his child and her needs. So it was such a beautiful solution that they come up with on their own. So it's, it's knowing that this is going to be a huge stress. Everyone knows you're all going to be tired. You're all doing so much work, whether it's out of the house or in the house, but caring for a child. And then just by default, or we like to say in fair play, she fault <laughs> doing all the other stuff in the house, right? Just because you're already home. Like that's what happens is that's, and that's why these become mom jobs. Like later on, like now that my child's four, like I have all these like default roles because you do them when the baby's home and you're just doing them around caring for the baby. But you have to be really careful because then those become your jobs right. forever unless you have these conversations. So having these conversations up front is like golden. And um, again, like workshops, um, seeking out facilitators, reading the book with your partner and having these conversations before it gets so emotionally charged, before the resentment builds, like the, the goal would be to avoid this. Like, I would love to not have to do fair play workshops. I would lo love to not have a job in fair play so I could work with moms and just focus on what lights them up. Like, I would love to skip this part. But this oh. part is so necessary today. So that's why, like, if you can get ahead of it, um, you're going to win the game. You're just going to win all day long. And I love it too, because not only is it never, you can do this when you're pregnant. It's never too late to start. Like, I'm no. telling you all. Well, you can listening. do this when you're a child has left the house you can do this as empty nesters like there every every partnership can do this it took us three kids to figure out how to do this like we didn't start yeah. doing this kind of stuff in our house till we were getting ready to have our third um but i love that you can read the book you can watch the documentary all the way up to you can follow facilitators on on social media like if that's yep. if that's your jam but i am so excited about this and just i hope anybody listening will be a little bit inspired to, to look at this a little bit further, maybe order the cards or yep. dabble in it, dabble in it online. So yeah. Oh my gosh, Julia. I mean, we could talk all day. We didn't even get into so many things, but I want to thank you so know, much for your time. And thank you to everyone who's listening. I will make sure that we link in the show notes, more access to fair play, including if you are local to Boston, how to find Julia. But thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Thanks, Emily. All right, everyone. I'll see you or talk to you soon.